Hello, all, and welcome to another episode of The Manly Catholic. And today I have a very special guest with me. He is the producer and host of the podcast Real Modern Catholic. Uh, with me is Dallas Dagampat. How are you, Dallas? Welcome to the podcast. I'm great, James. Thanks for having me. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. Now, did I butcher the last name or did I do okay? Aces. You got oh, it. Right. Perfect. All right. We're starting off on a good track. So, uh, just a little bit about uh, kind of Dallas and my background. So we met on Instagram. Uh, Dallas is going to touch a little bit more into how he started his Instagram page, but uh, he started that and then eventually moved into the podcast realm as well. Um, so can't wait to to talk more about that. So <clears throat> Dallas is a high school teacher and he's the, the big topic that we're going to talk about today, especially is kind of the dangers of society and the, the confusing, confusing messages that they're sending out to uh, our boys and girls in society today, especially with uh, just everything as far as, you know, the toxic masculinity, the message, especially for young boys are, are being uh, basically driven home every single day and how confusing it is for boys. Gotcha. I remember when I growing up, I'm sure you can relate to this Dallas as just seeing the stuff now. It's like, I don't know if I could have survived as a young boy. And it's just the pornography is rampant and everyone has a cell phone and instant messaging and stuff like that. It's just crazy. Totally different than, I mean, I, I'm only 33. So it's not like I was a young bug that too, not too long ago, but uh, yeah. 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 And, and I'm not that far away from you. So I'm 27. Yeah. yeah. And ironically, just the other day, one of my students asked me, you know, do you think it was harder to be a teenager uh, when you were in school or, or right now? Mm -hmm. I said, Oh, no doubt right now. Yeah. Oh, like, easy. The amount of information that is being thrown at you. I mean, just really rammed in your face constantly, the pressures of social media, and that's just a whole other can of worms mm. to open up there. But yeah, no doubt harder now. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, so before we dive too deep into that, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. I always want to ask a couple questions just to kind of warm you up, so to speak. So the first one is, if you could be the patron saint of anything, what would it be and why? That was a tough one. Uh, so <laughs> golf was the first thing that came to mind. All because right, big I golfer. Yeah. Um, but on a more serious note, I would have to say families. I know okay. St. Joseph lays claim to that one. Um, but man, speaking of St. Joseph, I was just at uh, Adoration last week. And uh, I'm getting ready to get married here in the summer. And congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And, and so St. Joseph was on my mind. I, this, the timing of it was really ironic. I started reading uh, the gospel of Matthew from the very beginning and going through St. Joseph's story at the beginning of the gospel and just thinking about, man, what a role model this guy mm. is. And he didn't say much, but talk about leader talk about protector provider. Uh, and so, yeah, patron saint of families. I know it's his, but I would like to join that. That's beautiful. Yeah. I guess St. Joseph, what a, what a rock star. I, I was, I was listening to a podcast, I think. And they said, you know, the, obviously St. Joseph has no recorded words in the gospels, but we know he had to have said one word because he was the one that named Jesus. So when they asked him, you know, like what's his name? He had to say Jesus. So just, there you go. gosh, I'm just like getting goosebumps on it, but just what a rock star of a man, you know, yeah. and obviously the patron saint of families is, that's awesome. Yeah. So, okay. If you could sit down with anyone, a dead or alive, who would it be and why? St. Augustine, because yes. I think his story, right? Like with his mom and then him, just an incredible one. Talk about a conversion. Uh, and I also feel like it would be a lot easier to have a conversation with him than to read his entire confessions. So I'll take the beer. That's, that's <laughs> fair. See you, someone who's so brilliant, but it's like, I just want to talk to them because yeah. I try to read them and they just confuse the heck out of me. So let's yeah. just have a conversation. That's great. I love that. Yeah. St. Augustine. Yeah. Another, another, you got like St. Joseph's and St. Augustine. You're starting off strong here. I like it. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So Dallas, I'll, I'll give this to you. Just tell us a little about your background, um, you know, born and raised, how you started Real Modern Catholic and yeah, whatever you want to share with our audience before we get going. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I'm from Southern California, moved to Texas. I've been here for probably about 10 years now. Um, 
I finished school when I got here. Uh, I teach and I coach. I teach at a different school than I coach at. And so I get to see two very different realms because I teach at a public school. I coach at a Christian school and they're just, it's just great experience being able to see both ends of it. Uh, I was born a cradle Catholic, but like many cradle Catholics, I could do everything at church that we're supposed to do during mass. I could recite prayers, but I didn't really know why I was doing the things I was doing. I didn't know why I was praying the prayers that I was praying. Um, and so there wasn't a really strong catechesis, but there was definitely a strong push, uh, you know, from my grandparents, my parents about, you know, belief in God, uh, faith, hope, optimism, mental toughness. Uh, but I got a whole ton of that, but not really Catholic stuff. And I'll get to that in just a moment. But in 2000, around 2015, I started to go through some, some life experiences, I'll put it that way. And among those, uh, I was really trying to discern, man, I, you know, I feel like God is calling me to have a family and, and to be a husband and a father. And at the same time, I feel like he's calling me to be a pastor. And so that was a real struggle because, as you know, you can't be a priest and a dad. Now, obviously, there are some exceptions for you know guys who are pastors of Protestant denominations and then come in later. But for the most part, you can't be a priest and a dad. And so that was a real struggle for me to deal with. And uh, speaking of dad, I had a, a conversation with my dad over lunch one day. And, and I said, you know, this is what I'm thinking. I, I feel like God's calling me in two different directions. And so if it's not, if I can't be a dad and be a priest in the Catholic church, but I can be in these other Christian traditions, then it must be that I belong in one of these other Christian traditions. Mm. Um, and credit to my dad, uh, parents always have a way of being right. And it's really annoying, but credit to my dad. He said, you know, really pray and discern is God giving you an out or is he testing your faith? And so maybe stubbornly, I left the conversation thinking, no, I'm set. I've got to go find whatever Christian tradition it is that I belong to, supposedly. Um, but if I'm going to leave, then I need to go find the right one, like the truest church. And so it was really in my effort to become not Catholic that I found out that I was right where I needed to be. And so uh, that's how that happened. Um, fast forward a few years later, 2020 during COVID, I was just on fire. I started reading, uh, and listening to everything that I could get my hands on and, and, and hear and watch. I got, uh, this urge, this desire to share what I was learning for the first time. And I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know the methods or the means, but I just knew I wanted to do it. So I started at Modern Catholic Life on Instagram. And it began with just kind of some pieces of scripture, some saint quotes, uh, and then started a podcast where I talk a little bit about Catholic stuff and, and more recently have made it a little more personal, uh, just kind of sharing more about my life. Cause I do think that there's, I've learned that there's great power in personal testimonies. And so, yeah, that, that, that's about where I'm at right now. And now I get to join you on your podcast. I just, that's amazing. Isn't it funny how I hope my sons say that about me one day. Like, dad, it's annoying that you're right all the yeah. time. You know, <laughs> we, we all have that dream, but God, that that's powerful. Cause I mean, I had no idea about, about that, but that's kind of like your, your turning point, if you will, is that, Hey, is I, am I called away from the Catholic faith? I mean, just talk about discernment that, and then having, but I mean, that kind of speaks into what we're talking about tonight, but having that fatherly figure, not only to, even, not even to give advice, but just someone that you trust and that he happens to be your dad. I mean, that's just powerful in itself right there. And the fact that he gave you great advice is, is, is a, a huge benefit, but I mean, just the fact that he was there for you, I think so many boys are missing that. And then it get, they get tied up into the, the craziness of our culture who's telling them, you know, they would probably say, oh yeah, like 
like Catholic, is it, is it really where you want to be anyways? Like they have all those rules and, you know, you have to be celibate, which is kind of weird, you know? So, I mean, yeah, that's, that's awesome that your dad did that. And I mean, and, and turned into a, obviously a huge blessing where you are now. So it, praise be to it God. It has been. Yeah. And obviously, you know, as you know, no matter how close we are to our faith, we're all sinners, um, oh gosh, but, we, yeah. but we strive every day. And so that's where I'm at. Yeah. No, that's beautiful. So I, I know you said in the background too, you're, you're t- a teacher, teacher mm-hmm. in high school. So I guess speak to as broadly or as specific as you want, I guess in your experience, just it, with the boys and girls that you teach every day, what are kind of their biggest struggles that you have noticed or maybe that they've told you in society nowadays? Yeah. And I kind of touched on it a little bit at the beginning. Social media is a huge one. Hmm. The constant comparisons that they, I guess that they impose on themselves because they're the ones picking up the phone and logging on and looking at it, but the constant comparisons that are out there for them. um, It's a great struggle because, uh, you know, I teach high school kids and they have this idea that once they graduate, they're supposed to have everything figured out and, and they have these other images that they see on Instagram, TikTok, whatever, of people doing all these great things. When those are just snippets, they're not in context of their entire life. And so if you compare your life to theirs, you're not really getting the full picture. And that can be, that can have a really harmful and negative effect, uh, particularly emotionally on young people. And as you know, that's where young people are guided by so much by their emotions. Secondly, um, man, I feel like they're really lacking someone to, to make clear to them that there are going to be really hard times in life. And that when those struggles come your way, you'll be okay. You'll get through them. Um, you know, I mentioned something, a piece of advice my dad gave me uh, earlier. And another one was, I remember from being a very, very young person, always hearing my dad say, there are beautiful times in life. There are struggles in life. There are good times in life. There are okay times in life. And that really helped me get through all of my challenges and my struggles. When I talk to, to young people, it's like, they've never heard that before. And so the first time that they go through something you know, at least to them is challenging and is a struggle, they kind of freak out and they feel like their world is coming to an end. It's like, hold on a second. Like life is full of struggles. It's full of great things. There's suffering, you know, as a Christian, obviously we know that, but you'll be okay. Like there's light at the end of the tunnel. And, you know, because of my profession, I don't get to say this explicitly, but like Jesus rose from the dead. Mm-hmm. And so if he could conquer that evil, that's the worst of them. And so you'll be okay. I think too, just the perspective that you share and yeah, I mean, social media is, uh, it's so hard because, you know, both of us who run social media pages, <laughs> uh, but it, it's, it's a struggle for me too, where I am, um, where I am you know, asking, is this actually beneficial for me? Am I truly doing this to like, evangelize or grow the podcast or use it as a mar- marketing tool, which is what it should be, or am I just using it to kind of be sucked in? Cause it's so easy for me to get sucked in. I don't know how you're, I mean, some people are great about setting boundaries, but man, if I like stray for two minutes, I'm, I'm done. So as a teenager who again, and as you said, Dallas, just having that perspective of, you know, they could have spent three hours getting that one picture on Instagram, but you didn't see that they could have been, you know, having the worst day of their life. And they ended up just getting like a quote unquote, good picture, what you think is a good picture, but yeah, just having that constant. It took 300 snaps to get the good picture, the one good picture that you saw. Exactly. Yeah, Yeah, (laughs) exactly. But just having that expectation too. And I think for, for boys and girls is having that good group of friends too of your peers. Cause one thing to have a mentor and things like that, but if you have a solid group of peers that they don't really care about that kind of stuff, I think makes all the difference in the world. I mean, the common saying, you're the, the average of the five people you spend the most time with, you know, if you can get those five people that are trying to grow in their faith or are trying to better themselves and 
aren't too concerned about what society is telling them, things like that. I mean, obviously that makes all the difference in the world. Uh, I know that was a huge impact on me. Um, and then seeing other people go in different directions in high school and things like that. And it's like, oh, they're hanging around that crowd. I guess that makes sense that they end up being steered in that direction. So same thing nowadays, just at a more, I guess, escalated scale, if you yeah, will. You're- Yeah, you're absolutely right. And like one of the things that I tell the students all the time is that one of two things is always happening. A, you're influencing your environment or B, your environment is influencing you. Whether you know it or not, whether the people you're around are cognizant of it or not, that's what's happening. And so for young people, the message I would say is really pick your friends wisely. Are these people who are like-minded? Are these people who are goal-oriented? And not in a selfish way, but ask yourself, uh, are these people helping me get to where I want to get to? Right. Absolutely. And I think <laughs> it's, it's so funny. Like think as a high school boy, like I never thought about that really, you know, like are these people actually building me up or are they bringing me down? I mean, especially I was involved in sports and stuff like that. So I didn't really care. It was, it was mostly like, Hey, I wanted to look good because I was on the the basketball team or the football team and stuff like that. And then I mean, obviously hindsight is 2020, you look back and like that really didn't matter. And that's such a small snippet of, of my identity in high school. But it's, I mean, the, another thing too, is that their, their brains are just still developing. So they don't even have the luxury of a fully developed brain. You know, it kind of ties into the next question I was going to ask you is that, you know, obviously the brain development aspect, but I mean, hormones are, are raging up and down crazy. Pornography is just absolutely rampant in this day and age. And it's just, it's destroying boys just left and right. I know father Dom talked about a couple podcasts that he's had boys like as young as six years old I heard coming that. In and confessing about pornography. Yeah. And like, it literally breaks my heart. Like that is where society is, is coming to. And I, I wanted to ask you because I mean, you deal with this every day. Have you noticed even from your time as a teenager in in high school, have you noticed kind of like a, a shift, I guess, in how boys and girls interact, um, as far as their, their, their relationship, not only to the opposite sex, but also to each other and how they relate to each other. Um, I guess I'll kind of throw that out to you. Have you noticed any kind of paradigm shift with just the relationship aspect, like basic social skills and, and interactions with one another? Yeah. I mean, the social skills part, I mean, that's a rabbit hole we can go down. Um, maybe, maybe that's another okay. time. Cause that's, yeah. yeah. Uh, but like the, the boy to girl relationship, uh, maybe more broadly speaking, like my observations out in public or stuff, there's a, there's a, I don't know. I think you see more often girls, young women acting more like the dominant figure and you see the guys being much more submissive. And that's not to say that there's something wrong with, with men and guys, you know, tapping into care, gentleness, emotions. I don't see anything wrong with that, but when you remove or try to take away, you know, masculinity and replace it with femininity to a creature who is masculine, like that's, that's not how it's meant to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, like w- there's this saying of create yourself or they're just trying to create themselves. I can't stand it because you can't create yourself. I think that a better way to phrase it is find yourself. Like God created you to be special in your own unique way, but guys are different than girls in, in, I should say this, they're similar. We're similar in a lot of ways. Uh, but in the ways that we're different makes a big difference, if that makes sense. Uh, and so just, I guess, seeing the role reversals a little bit is something that I can point out. Yeah, I, I, gosh, it was, I think it was um, the book by Jason Craig, Leaving Boyhood Behind. And he, he had a snippet in there that it kind of speaks to that because you mentioned the, not that the caring side of men is bad. And he was talking about how, he, he goes on like these retreats with, with boys and stuff. And he was t- talking about how there was this group of, I think it was high school or junior high, these like troublemaker boys. And they went on a hike somewhere and a girl like sprained her ankle 
or something. And so she couldn't walk anymore. And these troublemaker boys, there's like a, a group of them, like four or five, they rose to the occasion and they stepped up and they literally like took turns, like carrying this, this girl, their peer, like up the mountain pretty much. And again, that that's that caring side. But what we're missing now is we have the caring side, but we don't have the masculine side to, to counter it. Right. So right. what those boys exhibited was that masculinity, like, Hey, there's, here's a woman in need. We're going to step it up. We're going to be chivalrous and we're going to sacrifice ourselves some discomfort from ourselves. And then we're going to, to get this girl up the mountain. Cause that's, that's the right thing to do. Yeah. And so I think, so what you brought up is that the, the beautiful side of, of men is that they do have that, that caring side, that gentle side too. But what's missing is that the masculine side. Mm -hmm. And I think if, I mean, our culture has just pretty much just shot it down and said, no, like you boys are too aggressive and boys are too mean and boys get in fights and that's bad and things like that. And, you know, controlled aggression. I mean, I don't know if you follow Jordan Peterson at Absolutely. all, but he is huge on like the importance of boys, especially with wrestling with their dads, bringing up the father again. And cause that's how they learned that like, yes, you have this aggression and it's not bad. It can be bad, but it needs to be controlled because men are naturally more aggressive. We have testosterone and we're naturally more inclined to get in fights and, you know, go to prison because we tend to do more violent things. That's just our nature, but it's a nature that is not bad in itself, but because we're fallen, it can be turned into a negative aspect of it. So there are kind of things. a tangent there. So no, <laughs> no, I mean, you're hitting the nail on the head and there are a few things that I want to speak to, uh, yeah. to that. So there was, uh, some training, some staff training that I had to do for the Christian school that I work at. And so it was about Christian worldview and whatnot. And, and obviously in the context of a school setting and the person who is delivering the, the staff development that day, he talked about how boys are going to do one of two things. They're either going to build and protect, or they're going to destroy and tear down. Mm -hmm. And like, just naturally, that's what's going to happen. And so the obligation of the people who are supervising them, parents, teachers, coaches, what have you, it's their job to teach them how to channel it so that you do more of the building and protecting and less of the destroying and tearing down. Hmm. Yeah, that's, and, that's... yeah. So the other thing is uh, there was a book. So when I started going through those kind of life experiences, what I called them uh, early on uh, back in 2015, I started reading a bunch and I hated reading, hated reading, but because of what was going on in my life at the time, I had a lot of days to myself. And so I was like, eh, I'm kind of annoyed with what's going on. Like I, I watch the same sports center loop every 30 <laughs> minutes. Like I'm tired of it now. I'm not big on video games. I get tired of scrolling. And so I started reading and it started with self-help books, started to go into Christian books and then uh, into everything Catholic. But one of the first books I read was uh, called Tied Up in Knots by Andrea Tenteros. Uh, highly recommend 10 out of 10. She talks about the subtitle is How Getting What We Wanted Made Women Miserable. Uh, mm -hmm. And she talks about, one, the, the progress from the feminist movement, but also, mm -hmm. but also the the negative components that have been used as methods, which is building up women at the expense of men, which if you stop and think about it is totally, it's the opposite of the other big social idea right now, which is, you know, love everyone and, and build others up. Well, how are we building everyone up if we're only doing it at the expense of men? You know, you're talking out of both sides of your mouth socially speaking. Um, but another key message in her book is that men and women are equal, but we're not the same. And I guess maybe a really simple way for me to think about it was, okay, math, right? Two plus two is four. And 
one plus three is four. Like they're both four, but we got there differently. If that makes sense. No, that, that I mean, that makes perfect sense. And that, I mean, it goes into, again, we, I know we kind of tie it all back to society, but just, you know, you can be whoever you want to be type of situation nowadays, just with transgenderism and you can marry whoever you want, you know, love is love type of thing like that. And then, but it, it speaks to men and women were made perfect. God made them perfectly. And they have a, a ton of characteristics that are very similar, but there is a distinction between a man and a woman. And, and exactly what you're talking about, society has now tried to make this black and white distinction into a more gray area. And it's just led to so much confusion. I mean, there's, you know, boys and girls who are not even 10 and they're saying that, you know, I'm a girl or I'm a boy and they think that's their identity. And it's like, no, like that's, I get, I get it's a confusing time, but it doesn't mean, and then we have these parents who are just like, oh yeah, you can go and, you know, get the surgery or whatever. It's like, oh my gosh, like, what are we doing to our, these poor children? I mean, the yeah. thing that just really makes me mad, especially becoming a parent is whenever things just start affecting the kids who are so helpless, so defenseless, and they're relying on us to be these, these kind of rocks in their life. And we're just totally letting them down. It's just, it's so sad. And it just, it speaks to what we need as society and is men and women. But in my opinion, it's more the men who have kind of taken a big step backwards. Uh, they men need to step up and say like, enough is enough. Like you can't do this to my kids. Like you can't poison their mind and expect me to be okay with it. Yeah. You know? And Father Dom talks about this repeatedly. I think if he ever gets a PhD, this is going to be his thesis, but he always talks about how, you know, when, when Eve fell first, where was Adam? I was about to bring that up. <laughs> yeah. Where, where the heck was Adam? Either he wasn't there or he was there. And he just said, all right, Satan, go ahead. You can talk to her. That's fine. You know? Yeah. And, and then when God showed up, she made me do it. Yep. Right? I, I point the, finger the finger pointing game. Her. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you you mentioned, you know, the role of parents in all this, and this is just in a more broad context. I think parents who, and I see this from people who are my age, like I remember going to some friends' houses, um, you know, friends of friends' houses and seeing parents who are more concerned with being their kid's friend rather than their parent. Mm -hmm. And, and Man, when, once you get into that territory, it's like we've lost all sense of structure, which is what kids crave the most. They oh have gosh. no idea. They have no idea how much they need it until you start giving it to them. And then they realize, mm -hmm. oh, my gosh, like where, how come no one else tells me this? You know, and the other thing that no one tells them enough is that they can do whatever, you know, within natural law, whatever it is that they set out to do. Like mm -hmm. not enough people tell young people, Hey, you can accomplish this. If you set your mind to it, right. Hey, there might be some struggles, some suffering that you go through, but you can get through it and you can achieve this goal. And it's sad that there aren't enough adults being adults in that sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're more interested in being, like you said, their friend versus an adult. And, and it ties in too with the, the church. Yeah, because growing up Protestant, um, kind of one of my objections, if you will, was, you know, like those Catholics, they have all those rules, you know, rules and regulations. And I think it was, I think it was Bishop Barron. I can't remember though. It's like, we have all these rules for everything else in our life. But when it comes to religion, we don't want rules all of a sudden. So he, he it was Bishop Barron. And he talked about like the game of golf. He's a huge golfer and you, you like golf too. So perfect. And he was talking about like, if you just played golf or baseball, I think it was, if you just played baseball and there are no rules, everyone just kind of hit the ball and like you were out or you're safe and nobody knew what was going on. That's not fun. That's not, yeah. that's not enjoyable. That's just chaos. Right. And then when it comes to church, it's the same thing. If we just, 
if if it's just a free for all, it's not it's not really important anymore. It's just oh yeah, you, that's nice. You guys do over there, and that's what le- has led to hundreds of thousands of denominations, and in the Protestant churches, you know. Yeah, so. that's exactly right. And I think he he did a baseball one and he did a golf one. He said, he did you know, do imagine, golf. okay." He said, "Imagine yeah. if someone just moves the hole every time you hit it. <laughs> or, you never know if you've gotten there or not." You know, right. and like, I think it was Aristotle who said the, the primary responsibility of an educator is to inform the pupil of what he ought to do and what he not ought to do, meaning mm-hmm. what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad. And when you remove a, someone who's supposed to be that figure in a young person's life, like they're just left at the whims of wherever society takes them. Yeah. And we know where society is going. It's definitely not towards the church. That's for yeah. sure. So, no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so I mean, parents out there, I mean, my word of encouragement is, is, is be a parent first and then be, when they're older, you can be their best friend. I mean, I know like I have a wonderful relationship with my parents now, but when I was younger, my, I knew they were, they were the, the parents, you know, they weren't my friend, right. You know, there's someone I could confide in, someone I trusted but they weren't my buddies. And I think there's just too many parents out there that just want to be buddies. And that's just been a detriment to our kids. Yeah. And on that note, like I remember my dad telling me foolishly, foolishly, I would bring up from time to time. Well, so-and-so gets to do that. You're not so-and-so's kid. (laughs) I don't care what, I don't care what little Johnny's doing. You're going to do what I tell you to do. But uh, yeah, I mean, just, just the loss of guidance, but I will say this. I don't think that parents are doing it intentionally to misguide right. their kids. I think that they are doing it with care. I think there's too much of an emphasis on caring for the kids feelings rather than caring for what's at the expense of missing out on what's best for them in the long run. Right. I like, um, maybe, I don't know. Maybe I'm weird and I like touching a hot stove and I get some thrill from touching a hot stove. Like uh, as a kid, like, Oh, the excitement of doing that. Yeah. But I shouldn't do that. Right. And then if I have a parent saying, I know you like doing that, but it's not good for you. That's what kind of has to kick in more, I think. Oh, absolutely. And and it talks about, I mean, you brought up St. Augustine in the beginning. And then St. Thomas Aquinas talks about, you know, the, the orders of our passions, you know, when we are a society that is run by our passions versus our higher will, our intellect, then this is what results. And that is a great parallel is that we have become too concerned about our feelings and hurting other people's feelings. I mean, not intentionally, but like speaking the truth to them. Mm -hmm which sometimes can be the last thing they want to hear, but they need to hear it because it's the truth. You know, just same thing with the, the child who they just keep touching a hot stove because it's a thrill to them. And you go, no, like you will eventually get to the point where this will become permanent on your hand. Like this right. will damage you permanently. Right. And, you know, if you're not someone who's going to tell them that they, they just don't know they're, you know, they're six or seven years old or whatever the age is, they just don't know. Yeah. And we know better. Old. Yeah. The only time they know is when they're older and they realize it for themselves and they go, crap, how come no one told me to stop? How come, told, how come no one told me not to do this? How come no one told me that I could go find excitement and fun and purpose in more meaningful and good ways? Like, why did no one say that to me before? Yeah. And, 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 but by that time they're 30, 35, 40, and you've missed out on all that part of your life. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I mean, going back to the touch on the pornography thing too, and, you know, masturbation is, I mean, that's a, that's the thing I struggled with a lot too. And I remember specifically too, when uh, I, I kind of had something in the back of my mind, like, this doesn't seem right, but, and I Googled it, you know, Dr. Google and everything I read was, oh, it's normal. It's healthy for a young boy to explore and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And like, what, a wicked thing to tell a young boy is like, Oh yeah. Like it's okay. Like it's a natural thing to do. It's like, no, it is completely destroying your, if you're called to be married, 
uh, you're, you're destroying that, that future relationship, not only with your future wife, but just relationships in general, mm-hmm. you know, that instant gratification or um, objectifying women, especially. I mean, because men are so visual, such visual creatures as pornography has just kind of destroyed their view of women, which is, you know, a huge struggle, especially in boys too, as they develop. Yeah. So I was on, I think it was Instagram or Facebook the other day, and I'm scrolling on their uh, reels. Mm -hmm. And it was a clip of some kid during a high school pep rally playing, I, I guess what was an intro to one of those websites, like a song that goes on when you go into one of those websites and the caption was this kid got in so much trouble for this. And I didn't recognize it. I didn't know what it was, but everyone in the gym during the pep rally started laughing and cheering and kind of giggling because they all knew what it was. And I'm like, these are like 14, 15 year old kids, you know? And like, it's so widely known. I'm like looking in the comments. I'm like, what is like got in trouble for what, but all these kids know it. I was like, man, like talk about society really swaying us in, in not a good way. So on a similar note, uh, I was watching, are you, uh, the last kingdom? Have you watched on Netflix? I just finished season five, man. Okay. So I, <laughs> yeah, I just finished it too. Great, probably my favorite series. Uh, oh, yeah. you know, if you get past the, the explicit stuff, fewer discretion is advised. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. But like you, it gives you a little bit of an insight as to how societies were, how people thought, how people behaved, how impulsive they were, how reactionary they were, how drived by their desires, like you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And like, think about then and think about where we are now. And uh, thanks be to God that there's been such progress now, but there's still a long way to go. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it's funny you brought that show up. I, I was talking, my wife and I have been talking about this and in the lack of like good quality shows out there anymore, uh, just entertainment in general. And we watched, uh, oh, I'm blanking on the name. Oh, I watched uh, Ted Lasso, mm-hmm. which is on, yeah. So I don't know if you watched Ted Lasso. Goldfish. But- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, just a feel good show where there's no like hidden agenda but it just it i guess it warms your heart and it sounds so cheesy to to say that but with all the the crud that's being thrown at us you know the negativity in the news and just our world is in just utter chaos and we have you know hollywood that is just throwing all these like hidden messages at us anymore and you know that it's dictating culture and we just have lost the sense of what you fill your mind and your heart with is how you are going to behave. And, you know, the importance of guarding your heart, guarding your, your tongue, guarding your family, going back to St. Joseph, which you brought up at the beginning is, you know, as the men, I mean, you are the, the front gate, you're the gatekeeper to your family. You know, if you are not fighting Satan, you are just allowing him into your garden. You know, and who's he going to go after? He's going to go after your wife. If you're married, he's going to go after your children. And you have to be the one and say, no, the buck stops with me. Like, I'm not going to let you in. You have to get through me if you want to get to this family. So yeah. and- this is just a side note. So yeah. we're going through our marriage prep. And one of the questions on the, I think it's called the pre can the little survey you take. Mm-hmm. Were you, were you married Catholic in the, in the church? Uh, we were in the church. Uh, but I was still Protestant at the time. Did you yeah, guys? But we did the so whole. You thing. did the whole thing. Okay. Yep. So like the, the hundred question. The yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, one of them was like, "Who do, do your kids come first in your marriage?" And mm. it's just like phrased very vaguely like that. Yep. And so naturally, we both put yes. Uh, but then we we have the sit down meeting with the deacon. You know, a week or two later. And he comes to that question and he's like, now actually the church teaches no, because maybe the most sacred relationship you can have is that with your spouse. And so who does Satan try to get at to divide the parents? Oh, he goes for the kids. 
So the kid goes to dad and asks, dad says no. And so what does the kid do next? Oh, the kid goes to mom and mom says yes. And that causes conflict between mom and dad. But yeah, just a side note there. No, that's great. Yeah, that that's a great questionnaire. I mean, it just stirs great conversation. Yeah, so I'm I'm so glad the Catholic prep for marriage in most dioceses is, is extensive because it's just things that you don't think of. You yeah, know, it's not just like, hey, you show up and like, hey, we're getting married. This isn't this great. It's like, no, it's actually pretty hard. So yeah, when I go ahead. I was going to say, when's your wedding day, by the way, if you don't mind me asking? It's in the summer. Uh, I don't know Great. exactly when yet, but yeah, it's yeah. in the summer. No, that's awesome. But I would love to have uh, you on mine and, and talk a little bit about marriage prep in the Catholic Church, because I know from the outside looking in, probably, you know, you experience some of this as a Protestant still, like, mm. what is all this that I have to do just to Oh, get yeah. Married? Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, we can That'd definitely be awesome. do that. Yeah, we can, we can set that up. Um, awesome. Yeah, but going back to the how Satan infiltrates the family, I remember with with Father Dom when we were in spiritual direction, and he was he's basically kind of telling me to, you know, when you're feeling uh, consolation and desolation, if we want to use those terminology with saying Ignatius, that you'll start to notice the tactics that he uses because he never changes his tactic. And I noticed with myself too, he always comes after the relationship with my wife. Yeah. Like if I'm having a bad day or I didn't sleep well because the kid was up all night, and he immediately is like, Hey, like your wife, your wife said that one thing to you yesterday. Like, did what does she mean by that? And start you know, to stir and the pot a little bit. Stir the pot. Yeah. He just, <laughs> he just pokes. He just yeah. constantly poking at you, you know? And uh, the, the point I'm, I'm trying to bring it is that he is, he's attacking our families. And when the wife and the husband are divided, again, like what you said, how, who's going to be affected by it? It's mm-hmm. going to be the children. I mean, divorce rates in this, our society is just, you know, rampant as well. And when they, when children don't have that stability, I'm sure you've seen that being a teacher, when they don't have that stability, they naturally look somewhere whether it's their peers, whether it's a teacher, whether it's their coach, they, they need someone, they need some sense of stability because that, and that's just so sad is that what should always be stable in a child's life is a a mother and a father that's there for them. Just over 50% of children, sadly, nowadays, it's probably more now is it's just not happening. Yeah. And it's so sad for them. It's so, it's so destructive, the message that society is pushing this whole, do whatever you feel, be with ever who you want to be with today. And if it's someone different tomorrow, then so be it. And someone different the next day. And so be it. Yeah. But what happens when that, whoever you wanted to be with for the day turns into another human life, but now your feelings are telling you to go be with someone else the next day or the next year. Well, hold on a second. You have a kid now. And so like, there's a responsibility to the child for, uh, you know, like you said, a mother and father, kids who have two parents in the household do way better uh, in, in every social sphere than children who don't have two kids in the house or two parents in the house. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's, we can cite statistics all day, but yeah, it just, it's just crazy how how much that has affected children, but okay. So we've talked all doom and gloom Dallas. (laughs) So let's, let's, so I guess in your mind, because I mean, you're on the front lines. I mean, I, I admire teachers so much, especially those who, who, who teach, you know, high school and below just as, I mean, there's so much development going on. I, I mean, how do you think we can change this? How do you think we can change society? I mean, is it as simple as, Hey, don't get divorced. Or is there, is there something deeper than, than that? Yeah. I don't know what the formula is to change society, but I, you mentioned Jordan Peterson earlier. And Mm -hmm. one of the messages he pushes is fixing yourself first before you worry about fixing others, let alone the whole world. And so I think if, if people can individually reflect, I mean, just Take a moment at the end of each day. How did I react in that situation earlier? What words did I use? Could have I, could I have responded better 
you know, and, and just think about how you're being day to day. How can I improve day to day? I think we're more likely to develop a, a better conscious a more fully developed conscious. If we reflect on our behaviors, reflect on our thoughts, reflect on our actions and be open and willing to accept that maybe the way I thought was wrong and, and maybe an even more frowned upon statement is maybe the way you're feeling is wrong. Like you can't, like it's, it's almost illegal to tell someone that the way that they feel is wrong, but feelings come and go. And maybe what you felt two hours ago isn't how you feel now, which is most likely the case. Most likely you moved on and, and the reaction that you had, you wouldn't have that same reaction now. So just that reflection and thinking about how can I be a better person? Um, obviously with the, with the, within the Christian context, bringing Christ into that and letting him into your heart to transform your heart and, and conform your will to God's will. Yeah, that's beautiful. And Jordan Peterson, he has so many Catholic principles and he, he's so close to being Catholic. I he, just, refuses. I can't wait till he, he refuses. He refuses. He'll, <laughs> he'll be there one day. We'll just have to keep yeah. praying for him. But no, he has yeah. for the men out there. If you guys haven't heard of him, you haven't listened to any of his stuff. I mean, he has so many great, so much great material for, for men and especially boys out there. So I highly recommend him all the stuff that, that he has. Um, yeah, so Dallas, I guess for the last question I have for you. Is James. You, and yes. I, so I've got one more piece I just thought of right now. Yeah, please Going, share. Uh, so this was the very first book. I was 21, I think, 2021. First book I had read since like the sixth grade book report I had to do in middle school. <laughs> so again, I told you it started off with like self-help stuff. Why people fail. Uh, I was kind of kind of at a point in my life where I was like, yeah, I feel like I'm not doing what I'm capable of. And so got into the self-help, self-help books, which serve a purpose. Um, I, I now think differently about self-help. I think, well, uh, that's another conversation, but uh, the last chapter in there is titled focus on your strengths. And I think you know, we talked about how do we fix society a little bit? Uh, we've talked about the, the boy, girl, male, female uh, circumstance. Like, let's look at what do guys do well? And let's encourage those behaviors. What do women naturally do well? And let's encourage those behaviors. Rather than saying, let's do one at the expense of the other, positive reinforcements you know, focus on the strengths. And so that was just something that I thought of at the last minute right now. No, that's great. And it's so true though. I mean, I think too often we focus on our sins. Um, I can correct that. It it depends on the person, obviously, because some people are so, uh, most of us are our own worst critics. So we often focus on, well, I'm just not good enough, or I keep doing the same thing over and over again. Well, other people you know, they, they, they don't have that viewpoint, but again, it's, it's focus on what your, your strengths are. I think that's perfect. And then, cause you can build from there. Cause if you re- fortify your strengths, then you can always work on your weaknesses too. But I think sometimes as well, we are just so bogged down by the negativity mm-hmm. that it's hard to focus on the, the little bit of positive that we have. Cause we all bring something to the table. Yeah. We all have unique gifts. We all have unique talents. And focusing on that versus saying, well, again, going back to social media, like, well, this guy has, has that house or that car, or she's a cheerleader and I'm not, and I want to be that, you know, focusing on what you are and what you can do about that. I think is, it's huge, you know, focus on the strengths. Absolutely. That's, that's great. But anything else popping in your mind before I ask you what it means to be a manly Catholic (laughs) No. Uh-uh. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. So Dallas, uh, in your mind, in your words, what, in your opinion, does it take to be a manly Catholic? So this is where it all comes full circle yes. back to St. Joseph. Um, someone who is guiding, 
protecting, providing, leading, you know, all those things in a virtuous manner, that's a manly Catholic, in my opinion. That's beautiful. You can never go wrong with St. Joseph. Solid. And pretty much anything with masculinity, you're going you're gonna to nail right on the head. That's it. So, well, Dallas, it's been a blast. Um, I would love to have you on again sometime and love to come on your podcast, like you mentioned earlier. But um, yeah, is there anything in particular you want to talk about your podcast, talk about your Instagram page, how we can find you, uh, how our listeners can get in touch with you, things like that before we close out? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm on Facebook. Uh, Instagram, YouTube, and Spotify. Uh, they're all at Modern Catholic Life, at Modern Catholic Life. And what you'll find on there are, again, little pieces of scripture, just kind of some encouraging or motivating stuff. Uh, when I travel, I love going to churches, so I'll take some pictures of, of churches, some saint quotes. Uh, but then on the podcast, you'll find uh, just a, a variety of topics uh, that deal with the Catholic faith, Catholic uh, Catholicism in society today, but at Modern Catholic Life is where you can find me. And man, all I will put links in the show notes for this as well, and then I'll be posting when we uh, when this goes live to all my channels as well. With I'll be tagging you and everything, Dallas. So you'll be you'll be all over. <laughs> Likewise, I'll do the same for you. And I really love the conversation. I appreciate you uh, having me on, James. Yeah, absolutely. Well, man, that wraps up another episode of The Manly Catholic. So go out there and be a saint. <laughs>